Stream now on the Philippines' first educational podcast. This is OnePlus Network. Thank you for streaming OnePlus. I am Sir Kent, and today I will be teaching you about the speech act theory. Well, let's get started. Let's start this discussion or lecture with this quote I got on the internet. And it goes like this. There's always a little truth behind every just kidding, a little knowledge behind every I don't know, a little emotion behind every I don't care, and a little pain behind every it's okay. You know what? Sometimes we say something not because we want the person to take it literally, but because we want the person to read between the lines and try to grasp what we truly imply and want him or her to do. When our mother comes home and sees the dishes, the plates unwashed, she would go berserk and would say, beware, those may fly off the ceiling. The question is, Does our mother mean she would throw our plates off the ceiling? Or ask us to clean the dishes? As you notice, the language meaning is not always equal or synonymous to the language purpose. And that being said, is the focal point of the speech act. Theory. The speech act theory belongs under pragmatics, and pragmatics is a branch of linguistics that deals on the use of language in a social context. Simply put, it deals on how speakers say it and how others interpret the speaker's utterance in social context. What is okay here? may not be okay in another social context. My utterance here may be understood differently in other social contexts. The Speech Act theory was proposed by John Austin in 1962 and was further developed by John Searle in 1969. Austin was intrigued by the way we can use words to do different things. People believe that language is not only used to inform or to describe things. Do you agree? They say that words are often used to do things, to perform acts. In other words, actions perform through utterances are generally called the speech acts. What is a speech act? A speech act is an utterance that a speaker makes to achieve an intended effect. Therefore, there is a specific objective as to why we're uttering these words. A speech act is also defined in terms of a speaker's intention, and the effect it has on the listener's side or the receiver's side. Both Austin and Searle were concerned with what the speaker means, which is the speaker's intention when the speaker says something rather than what the utterance literally means in a language. Now, this theory of Searle and Austin delves into how words are used not only in giving information, but also in carrying out actions. There are three types of acts in every utterance. The locutionary act, elocutionary act, and prolocutionary. Let's start with the locutionary act. 
This is the act of saying something or making meaningful utterance. Simply put, it is what is said. Beware, those may fly off the ceiling, said our mother. The utterance of our mother is an example of a locutionary act. It is what is said. On the other hand, the locutionary act here is the performance of an act in saying something. This is the real action which is performed by the utterance or the real implication. What is the intention of our mother? Is it to throw the dishes off the ceiling or to ask us to clean or wash the dishes? The intention of our mother is to wash the dishes. So the illocutionary act here is, please wash the dishes or please clean the dishes. Those are the illocutionary acts. And lastly, the perlocutionary act. Perlocutionary act, according to Ruth M. Kempson, is the consequent effect on the hearer which the speaker intends and should follow from his or her utterance. Or the effect, the intended effect. This is the perlocutionary act. If the real intention of our mother is to let us clean or wash the dishes, we cleaning or cleaning the dishes is the perlocutionary act. If we're going to get an example in a classroom setting, there's a teacher and there are his or her students. When the teacher says, the door is open. What did the teacher mean? Did the teacher only describe that the door is open? Of course not. The teacher implies that please close the door. And you, as an obedient person, closes the door. And you closing the door is the perlocutionary act. Now, John Searle, in 1969, classified the illocutionary force into five. We have the first one, the representatives, wherein the speaker is committed to the truth of the proposition. The speaker may be asserting, claiming, or reporting. The second one, directives, wherein the speaker attempts to get the hearer to do something, such as suggesting, requesting, and or commanding. The third one is the expressives. The speaker expresses an attitude about a state of affairs, such as apologizing, complaining. The fourth one, the commissives wherein the speaker is committed to a course of action, such as promising, threatening, and lastly, the declaratives, wherein the person or the speaker alters the outward status or condition of an object or situation, such as declaring. When you declare a martial law, that declaration alone brings about change in the lives of the Filipino people. In the words of Antonio et al. in 2016, says have three. According to Antonio et al. in 2016, says have three kinds of meanings, prepositional or locutionary, which is the literal meaning of an utterance, Illocutionary meaning, which is the particular intention making the utterance, and perlocutionary force, which is the production of a particular effect 
to the addressee. Ruth M. Kempson stated, a speaker utters sentences with a particular meaning, the locutionary act, and with a particular force, the locutionary act, in order to achieve a certain effect to the hearer or the receiver, the prolocutionary act. Before I end this lecture or discussion, I would like you all to ponder on my questions. How well do we know the real intentions of the people around us? Or are we all duped by thinking that we already knew what they are saying? Thank you very much.